and uh, welcome to this installment of Bergeron Briefs. Uh, if you haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell, there are now, I think, 68 of us, uh, like 40 in Worcester and about 20 in Westboro and about 10 in Boston. I know that doesn't add up to 68. But anyway, uh, as a result of that, I get to do, each of us gets to do just what they really like, and I like doing elder law. Um, I, have, I do these shows to supplement the presentations that I do at the Senior Center that talks about more straight legal issues. And the purpose of these shows is to introduce you to people here in Ashland that you should know um, regarding uh, senior issues or programs you should know about or, or trends or things that are happening that you ought to be knowing about. Um, and I am delighted that my friend Tammy Pazaricki has joined me today. Um, because these folks need to know about some of the things that you do because they're directly connected to what Ashland is doing right now. As you, as you know, and as I was mentioning to you, Ashland has decided to be one of the next communities that is, that is going through the process of doing a, becoming a so-called dementia-friendly community by going out and doing surveys and doing all of that stuff. And, and, and Joanne Duffy, who is the, is, is the, uh, the co-chair uh, of the committee together with uh, Selectman Mitchell, Mitchell, I believe, and, um, I'm, I'm not local, so yeah. <laughs> who was on my show a few, uh, and, and talked a little bit about why he was interested in it. So uh, I asked you to come on because, as you know, I, I chaired the one in Marlboro, and I've been very interested in this issue. And when I start thinking about a, what a dementia-friendly community is and what kinds of things need to be going on there, I find myself thinking about stuff that you have done. So could you just talk to us a little bit about, first of all, kind of, you know, who are you and where did you come from and what do you do? <laughs> How's that? Sure. Um, so about nine years ago, I bought a home in Marlboro and renovated it to accommodate up to about 14 guests each day to come to Pleasant Trees. That's the name of the, the, name of the program. Right. Yeah. Um, to have a good quality of life and a good day. And it is specifically for folks who do have memory impairment due to yep. a dementia disease process, but they're yep. living in the community. Yep. Um, and I've been doing that for about nine years. And it's and, the so-called- And so by the way, before you did that, so your, your background is in- Social work. In social work. Yep, and I work, I've worked in various long-term care facilities and corporate um, owned, you know, worked in corporate. Yep. And I, this was just such a passion for me because my grandmother went through the disease process. So it was both professional and personal. And along my journey was, where does Grammy go? There's no place other than the senior center. For Grammy or, to go. Yeah. And, and for someone with dementia, that's very difficult to navigate. And by the way, it seems like most of the people who are really involved in this that's what happened. There was a family member, and now you get it. Because I remember my mother died in a nursing home, and I was like, oh, I get it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if, you, you, if you're you, personally touched once by Once you've it. gone through it. Once you've gone, so, you, so, yeah, so you've got, a, you've got a, basically a community with, with a senior center, but and folks that really, and I always tell folks, you've seen my presentations, my friends, my make-believe couple, Frank and Mary, whose goal in life is to live at home until they die and be buried in the backyard. Right. And, and, as, and as I tell folks, of course... If you if you if if you have dementia, right, the 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 you the more the more confused you are, the more you want to stay at home, right? Because you feel safe, you know where everything is, right? It's definitely an isolating disease it, in except, itself. Be, except that, right? You feel safe at home, but you're kind of nervous about going outside right. because you, are you going to get lost? Is someone going to make fun of you? Right. Because the, it's so much that the, you know this isn't thought of as a disease; it's like a embarrassment. Right? And when people think of adult day health, yeah. Those are more medical model, institutionalized settings, which have a place for the continuum of care. Yeah. But for the folks who attend pleasantries, they are super functional, high functioning. They yeah. are still independent with a lot of their activities. But socially, they need to be engaged with their peers. And yeah. that's key to slowing this disease process down. And so, t so tell me about... So what happens at Pleasantries, right? So the, First of all, do, so do folks, folks, do caregivers drop these people off? 
right? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 is it, and does it go all day? What happens at Pleasant? Yeah, so essentially uh, the caregiver brings their loved one in the morning. They yeah. get dropped off. They yeah. get a warm greeting. Um, we all sit around the breakfast table and enjoy breakfast together. Then we engage them in purposeful engaging activity all day long, utilizing their mind, their bodies, their spirit, everything to keep them engaged. Um, and we have folks stay until the very end. We make our own food, we serve lunch, we do gardening, outdoor activities, we visit the lake. Um, we just keep people normalized, just you know, kind of normalized normal. to a home environment. And they feel like they're going to their daughter's home rather than an institution which is yes. totally appropriate where they're at in their disease right now. Right. And, and well, as you know, so you know, one of my brothers-in-law who has been a, a resident there, I've had clients who've been residents there, and, and, and once again, it, everybody's goal is to be at home. Mm -hmm. And the ideal, the ideal, for all my clients, everybody gets it when you're older, you're gonna die. The ideal is to be at home until you die. That's right. And I know you've had that situation where you've had people who have been there literally until they died. Absolutely. Right. And, and others it didn't because the disease progressed and they needed some other things. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, home doesn't become helpful, right. actually unsafe and not a good solution. Um, so I counsel families on what the next steps of their journey looks like and yeah. what they can prepare for because I always say responding rather than reacting to a crisis is better, yeah. planning ahead. So. That's how I got to know you, actually, because right. it was because of pleasantries. But but in the meantime, right, one of the things that I came to learn about um, when we started working on dementia-friendly community on this initiative was the evolution of these things called memory cafes. Um, and then I found out totally by accident by talking to this woman at Jewish Family and Children's Services who was kind of coordinating this 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 kind of newsletter regarding all the memory cafes out there that you were the one who created the first one, and I didn't even know that, right? So now let's talk a little bit about memory cafes. What, what, so what is, what's the point of a memory cafe? What does it do, and how does yours work? Because they, and, and, and when did, you started it how long ago? 2011. 2011, and how many of them are, are there in Massachusetts now? Now there's almost 70. Almost 70. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about why you thought to do this so a and how it works. The Memory Cafe, the concept was started yep. in Europe and brought to the United States in 2008. And one of my caregivers read about it and gave me the information. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is a wonderful concept. One of your caregivers, one of the people whose who's, who's loved one was coming, was to, coming pleasantries. to pleasantries. Yep. So the closest one to Massachusetts was actually Dover, New Hampshire. So I went and visited. A memory cafe is simply um, a supportive environment. It can be held anywhere that's appropriate to serve the caregiver. So the caregiver brings their loved one with memory impairment. Yeah. And the idea behind it is- And the caregiver stays. It, yes, it's not a drop off respite. It's for benefit of both of them to get out, meet other people, yeah. and not be so worried about the disease and, and because it's such a stigma anyway. And about so, being embarrassed. And being embarrassed. Because now these, everybody is there. There's a, you know, it's like half of the people there have got dementia issues and half don't. Right? And, and what's beautiful about these memory cafes is you really can't tell. Who I has I, the... I, I, has, I would tend to fit in well there. <laughs> just kind of a confused... And thing. they're free. They're yep. free to attend. There's ref It's a, usually a couple of hours. And yep. they get entertainment and refreshments and... Pet therapy, music therapy, conversation, socialization. Yeah. And we have, I have many families who are now, we call them cafe hoppers, because they'll go to different locations for all the cafes. Um, and I do, on my website, actually have an events calendar that I keep the cafes listed because there are folks that they're all on different days and times. So they can go to multiple and meet more people. And it seems to me that you, you and the folks at Jewish Family and Children's Services have also been trying to consciously make sure that the new ones that come online don't conflict with the others. Right. So that we're, we're constantly evolving more and more places where within a fairly short drive, you know, you can, you can get out of the house. You can right. get out of the house and, and talk to some folks that you may know or may not know and kind of enjoy yourself. 
Yeah. Yeah, because people are so isolated and stuck. You know, they stop going to restaurants. They stop going out. They stop seeing family and friends. So this is a setup for 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 success yep. and yep. enjoyment. And they make friends. People have connected who have come to my cafe have actually connected on the outside of the cafes, which is beautiful. Which is great. By the way, you just reminded me of something which is kind of off topic. Um, restaurants, right? Yeah. People stop going to restaurants because you get this big menu and like, what is this about? And then you forget something and the waitress doesn't get it. And all of us, I remember talking to a woman, well, a mutual friend of ours who was a you know, her day job, she runs a senior center, but but her mother had dementia, and mm-hmm. she's out with her mother at and the at a restaurant, and the mother orders a sandwich, and the and the waitress brings it, and the and the mother can't remember, so she's like, oh, this wasn't what I ordered, and there ended up being like a fight with yeah, the it, waitress. So so, what's the t- t- tell me about purple reservations? Or purple the purple table reservation, the, and de- a friend, devel- developed by yeah. Talk yeah, about so it a, a friend of mine um, who runs a memory cafe at her restaurant, and, the restaurant, and, 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 and whose and whose mother had. Her mother passed at 62 with Alzheimer's. Wow. Wow. And as a restaurant owner, she did find that, that she was having folks come in who had the disease process and would leave, couldn't make it through a dinner. Um, She thought this was the best way in which to offer families the ability to go out to a restaurant and actually succeed have an, an enjoyable experience with their loved one. And this actually applies to not only Alzheimer's and dementia, but folks who have children with autism. Children with autism. The idea is, is that you call for a purple table reservation at a restaurant who has that, that purple table reservation option. What that means is you get a table that is in an appropriate area of the restaurant, well lit, um, it's not too loud. The staff at the restaurant is actually trained on how to deal with these diseases and the, and the caregiver and the person with the disease, and it makes it much more enjoyable. So sure. as Jennifer brings on these restaurants... And what is her name? Jennifer, Jennifer Apositis and her restaurant... And I won't ask you to spell that, but I will ask you after the show to make sure you give the folks here or to get them the contact information so that they can show that as a banner or something when they show this show? Absolutely, the, the because whole, it's could, being... Because you can click to a Purple Table Reservation list of restaurants, right? Right, and there's not a lot Which yet. Which is small but growing. Right. right? Uh, the restaurant she owns is the, called the Red Raven in Acton. In Acton. And we hold um, Lovely Linda's Lunches, which is her memory cafe. So that one's actually at the restaurant. Yep, uh, once a month. And when when does she hold it? Like what? Usually the the first Saturday of each month. But I tell folks to look at my events calendar because sometimes she has to make changes to her. And I was and I'm curious by the way. I know that when I first saw something like this, when when I first. You know, after I'd heard about memory cafes, I, I went to Minnesota with a with a group of people to kind of get trained on, because they kind of started a lot of this dementia friendly stuff. And it turns out one of the restaurants there, Arthur's Restaurant of all things, right, had a memory cafe right there. But they did it kind of off hours, and, you know, so they used the restaurant, you know, weird, t- you know, Monday afternoon from two to four. So that's why I was wondering if she was actually doing it at a, what would otherwise it's be a It's a very restaurant. quiet time. It's it during is. the lunch hours of Saturday. On Saturday. Oh, I see. And, and I she see. discourages people. And this would depend on the restaurant yep. because yep. she discourages people from making a purple table restaurant at her restaurant on Friday and Saturday nights. Of course. It's loud. There's so many people. And it's not conducive to what she's trying to do. Right. What's the point? Right. What's the point? Right. Because, because as you say, for one, among other things, if you've got dementia... That kind of noise and confusion, it just makes your experience worse. So to be there exactly. at a really, really busy time doesn't make any sense. Right. So we'll make sure we get the information of that. And, and so in, in the course of that, you mentioned that one of the things that makes this experience unique is that the waiters and waitresses themselves, the wait staff, is really trained, which relates to some of the stuff that we've talked about in terms of, once again, what is a dementia-friendly community? Ultimately, when I envision it, it's one in which all of the people who are working at all of the places that you would go if you were older, right? You might go otherwise, but if you would, but you would go if you were older, like a restaurant 
or the bank. You know, there are a set of players Town or, hall. Or, or people who are going to be dealing with you because they're first responders, because they may be going to you at your house because you've emer- got an emergency, or they may, there may be a traffic stop because you're driving and you've got dementia, that all those people have got training, right? And, and one of the many hats that you have been wearing, I've noticed, is that as part of the initiative that we did in Marlboro, Hudson, Northborough, um, we, we, so in, I know in, in Hudson, they, um, they really focused on getting their first responders trained. Right. And you did the training. Yes. Right? Put so, them can you, so can you talk a little bit about that, about what, what the nature of that, of that training is, what you're trying to show, and some of the experience in dealing with, with the first responders that you've trained? Sure. So I've, uh, so far, all of Hudson is complete. We've done... All poli- of Hudson is complete, which means... Police, yeah. fire, and EMT. And it's really to get them to understand what it means to communicate with a person with dementia, ver- um, to recognize things that maybe they're pulling someone over and they suspect intoxicated driving when in reality it's a person with dementia who's right. struggling. Because if, you, if, you're, if you're getting pulled over and, and you've got dementia, you're really nervous yeah. and, and you tend to be talking kind of abruptly because right. you've got no filter. They might be and, going which, to the... Which, ho- which seems a lot like a person who's drugged out. Right, right. And, and they might be going to a home where they're dealing with a domestic call where the person has hallucinations or delusions related to the dementia disease, when they're put through formal training, they're told, okay, you've got to talk them out of that hallucination or delusion. When they, when they're in training for, for other, police, for, 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 for other things. Right. And with dementia training, uh-uh. You become their trusted ally. You enter their reality. You, so it's a, it's a whole set of things and new for them to consider when they're using. And I provide them with multiple strategies and interventions so that they can put it into practice and not only in their professional life. Many hands were raised in the room when I said, does anyone have someone personal in their life that has dementia? Many hands went up. So we're doing right. that. We're rolling that out into the other towns too. So I was just going to say, I think the, I thought that there was a, there was a, a grant application actually the, to try yes. to get all three of the commu- all three of the or the other two community Hudson and and uh, and Marlboro to have that same level of training. Yeah, Northboro, Marlboro, Hudson. And I know that from the process that we went through in those communities, which was the very pro the, the same kind of um, uh, outreach and questionnaires and things that that they're working on right now in Ashland. When we came together after that work was done, that of course rose to the top of the the top of the list in terms of what do you, what how do you make a dementia friendly community? Well, it's really about having all those players get it. Exactly. Right? And I think you told me when you when you were doing that training too that a lot of those players you say really wanted to get it. They, they did they're because they deal of, with it anyway. Right. Whether they're trained or not, they have to face it. Right. You in know. order to kind of deal with, in, in order to deal with those players, so there's um, uh, places like Pleasantries, right? There is uh, memory cafes. There are memory cafes. There's this kind of training. I guess I'm. I guess I'm suggesting, and I'm just gonna go, gonna go back on to the camera. I'm suggesting that these may all be things that you want to think about here in Ashland, because the the process of developing a dementia-friendly community is unique to each one of, the, of your communities. So you may be really quite time to look at all of these as possibilities. Now, for, for folks who are living around here, is there a place, and I, I know your place is often referred to as a, adult, 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 day a, program, an adult day program, social model, a social model program. Day, yeah. Is there something like that that's close, that, or that's like around at, like, Ashland or kind of the communities like to the best of your knowledge is there something that's close right now there are three models like mine yeah. in the state in the state so there's you and you're so, in Marlboro and then there's and then one there's Wayland Wayland and then there's Westwood and there's Westwood so you know there there's such a need for this right. it is that piece of the puzzle that we all try to offer those services for the continuum along yeah. the journey of dementia yeah that so so that so that piece is kind of missing right now. How about now? If you know, uh, do you know of memory cafes that are close by? 
that are here? I know uh, that we've, um, we've got some in our in the immediate area. Yeah, the immediate Metro West, yeah. such as Westboro. Um, I know there's one just started in Northboro. Right, Northboro. We're hoping Marlboro soon. We're, we're in December. We're going to have our first our first memory and then at, going, at a restaurant. Actually, right. we're trying to do it at a restaurant. A wonderful restaurant called um, called Wellies, which is a terrific little restaurant in downtown Marlboro. And then Folks from, we even take people from Ashland, uh, the, the, and, and, and hopefully that'll work. I mean, my hope would be yeah. that as part of Dementia Friendly Community Ashland, that they would consider doing a cafe. Yes. And some of the various locations, like libraries, restaurants, senior centers, um, there's a multitude of opportunities, and I can offer some suggestions too. But now I'm just gonna jump back, by the way. There was one thing that I missed when you were talking about your program. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that in some place, specifically in Hudson, there is a, a program that's run out of the senior center. Oh, right. right. Called Daybreak. Daybreak, it's called the Daybreak program. Talk about that for a little bit. Sure, so, so Daybreak is a grant-funded program um, that Janice Long, the director, started, and I helped her along the, the way to develop this. It is a three-hour, once a week, on Thursdays, it's a drop-off respite program for folks with memory impairment. So the caregiver can enroll them, drop them off, um, and then go about their business, get some stuff done, do things for themselves and then come back in the afternoon and pick them up. And then and the programming that is being done sounds like it's similar to the things you do at Pleasant Street. It's very, it's non-medical, right. it's engaging activities. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of your staff people, I think even works at They the, run it. Also, <laughs> oh, yeah, they're, yeah they're, she's they're, they're the very director this there. Is a, this is a kind of a, this is a, kind of a, a, a world of people that I've got, a lot of, I've got a lot of hats on. I just wanted you to mention that because once again, I think that's, that's something that a number of senior centers are looking at or other folks who want to offer a shorter a shorter program. Right. Okay. So thank you very much for coming You're on. You're welcome. Thank you uh, for having me. I hope me. that this has been helpful to you in terms of just thinking, in, you know, envisioning the kind of ways in which you can develop a community. When I, whenever I try to describe a dementia-friendly community, I always say it's a place where no matter how confused I get, I can still live in my home and in my community and at the end of the day say, I had a good day. I might not remember everything I did, but I remember that I had a good day. And I think a lot of these things could really make are the things that the constituent pieces that really make that kind of community. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much, Tammy Pozricki, for being on the show. I look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Bridge Run Briefs. Thank you very much.